Hi everyone, welcome to Break the Wall, Sexuality, Revolution, Collaboration. I am Urja from MASH and I'm extremely honored to be opening today's discussion. Break the Wall is an, in, is an event curated by MASH and Nina Claire, founder of Pursuit of Balance and supported by our partners, Durex Powered Condom Alliance, The Bird and Bees Talk, and of course our media partners, Daily Hunt, Quintfit, and digital partner Josh, knowledge partners, Shivnad University, and Purpose. At Break the Wall, we're talking about all things related to sex, sexuality, reproductive health, and rights. Personally, I have been absolutely enjoying these conversations as I'm able to get diverse perspectives on topics that are extremely relevant for us today. Yesterday was a power-packed session. We saw Saddam hosting a panel of youth leaders and talking about the responsibility of, young, of youth and youth organizations in building a movement on SRHR. The day ended on a very exciting note with a workshop from the YP Foundation called Mardo Wali Bath, facilitated by Awali and Siddhant. If you missed yesterday's workshop, I would suggest that you keep an eye on today's link and the QR code, which will be displayed now. And join today's session that will be curated and um, talking about digital, uh, digital campaigning and storytelling by purpose. So trust me, you wouldn't want to miss out on this one. Thank you, Uja. We have a very power packed session. I'm so excited to be doing this. And ironically, the topic is digital media and changing discourse around sexuality and pleasure. Stay with me, digital media. My connection was not working. Thank God that's all resolved. But this is the world that we live in, right? And digital media sort of governs our connecting with people at this point. So thank you all for joining. We have a star studded panel with me today. And I'm super, super excited. Uh, to introduce my first panelist, Seema Anand, mythologist. I mean, there's a there's a very long list. I can't do justice to either to any one of the speakers at this point because introductions are so long. Hi, Seema. Hey. Like Thank you said, you this joining. whole digital thing is um, it's a nightmare. Yes. So my my speaker fell, broke, and then I because I'm in court, I'm separated. You know, I have COVID. I had to find an old wire to stick into my laptop and it's all resolved. I'm breathing through this, but I was just doing your introduction, Seema. And I was just saying that uh, uh, I, I, it's, it's too long for me to sort of give. So I'm going to do it in one sentence. Seema Anand, mythologist, Kama Sutra expert, author of Arts of Seduction, storyteller, and, and of course the list goes on and on. So thank you so much for joining us, Seema. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you have been swamped. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And like you said at the beginning, this power packed um, session that's coming through, thanks to you actually. So well done for putting it together because I know what it takes to put these things together, and especially in the middle of COVID. So yeah, I'm very excited. Thank you so much, Seema. Uh, Paramita Vora, somebody I'm a huge fan of and um, I had to remind her. Hi, Paramita. Thank you so much for joining in. My pleasure. So I was just I was just, uh, and Paramita is also dealing with the uh, remote control COVID management in Delhi with her family. So thank you for taking the time out for this. And, um, and I'd like to share with the audience that I, I love having a personal connect with each person that I speak to. And I was lucky enough to, to, um, to meet Paramita at one of her multimedia art exhibitions, I think two years ago. It was mind blowing, absolutely. The, the whole the, the 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 screen and the poetry imagery that came up and the whole erotica around it it was just fabulous so so thank you for thank joining you. us paramita um, is a is a filmmaker writer and founder of agents of ishq if you haven't checked out agents of ishq please check them out the most fabulous multimedia content put out there by paramita um, Paramita is one of the foremost voices, I would say, in love, sex, and desire out there. And both Seema and Paramita have been doing this for years before it became cool. So thank you for the work that both of you do. And since this is a youth event, we have Garima, 
Surana joining us all the way from Marseille. Are you there right now? Yes, yes, I'm pretty much here. Lovely. Seema in London, Garima in France, and Paramita, you are in Delhi or in Bombay, Bombay. right now? Bombay. Bombay, there you go. And me in Delhi. Look at this. Couldn't have done it otherwise. Thanks to COVID. The irony is, right, that it's been such a gift also at some level. So, um, like I mentioned, the topic is digital media and changing discourse around sexuality and pleasure. Um, I could keep chatting about, um, you know, what I what I think of all your works, but I think time is short. We have an hour, so I'd like to jump into um, our first question. And this question, Seema, I'd like you to answer first, and then Paramita, because both of you belong to the the pre digital era, right? Where 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 things were real, and we could there were nerve endings, right? So. Um, what was the discourse then around sexuality and how have you seen this change? Seema, first to you, please. So, um, Nina, you're right. So, Paramita and I started this pre-digital media, pre when it became the cool thing to talk about. Yes, there were nerve endings then. Um, I have to say that growing up, when I was at college, which was in the 90, early 1980s, um, it seems like we've actually regressed since then because just before that was the hippie era. So my parents, for instance, very much part of that very hippie era, which was, um, which talked about all these things that was post-war, people talked about this, they talked about peace, they talked about love. And all of this discourse had started. I find that as I grew up, um, post-college, post, -college, post um, getting married, etc., I've actually seen a downward slant since then. So. I've noticed that people are now suddenly more afraid of talking about it. And hence, it almost feels like a revolution that is starting because people are now wanting to get back to normalizing things and, you know, enough is enough of putting women to the back, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's actually uh, uh, maybe the digital media is picking up and actually creating a revolution where um, the need had to be done. But I don't know about Paramita. I'm sure she'll tell you about her experience. But like I said, being in college in the early 1980s in Delhi, I certainly find that we have regressed um, since then. Well, thanks for sharing that. Seema. Interesting perspective. I mean, I never thought of it like the whole the whole war angle. But yes, um, now that you mention it, it makes sense. Paramita, coming to you, please. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I guess, you know, although uh, there's an overlap in terms of time, and I also went to college in Delhi, maybe I don't quite feel that way because the war after all, I mean, I'm not sure which war, but the war in Europe and the US had a different impact there and a different meaning here. So I think like responses to those things, because in India, I mean, you are in a post-independence era, a sense of great optimism and hope, but then also a lot of disappointment by the 70s and the 80s. So I think there would have been an elite that was talking about sexuality in a certain way, right? And that continues to be the truth today. But I mean, anyway, those are larger and different conversations about history, you know? But in terms of the digital thing, like for me personally, it's a very different experience for the, and I often joke that though the internet came into my life when I was a full grown up, right? I was at the end of my twenties when the internet came into homes in India. But for me, it became the chance to actually have a youth which I don't think I had in the traditional sense because I wasn't a very typical young woman. I didn't really fit in uh, to certain ways of being, rom you know, like the ideas of romance and which were very, very actually normative when you look back, like even in people amongst people who are cool, I would often tease my so-called avant-garde male friends that I never seen you fall in love with a woman who wasn't traditionally hot looking, you know? So there was actually a lot of stereotypes that also used to circulate in so-called bohemian circles of which I was a part because my, you know, my grandparents were in the movies. I worked in film myself. So there was a kind of bohemianism, which was nevertheless quite stereotypical. So I never fitted in as a person who chose not to marry and began to live on my own at the age of 22 in tenement housing in Bombay because I didn't earn much money. It's not like I had a huge community of people. That community got built up very slowly over time as more and more women made those choices. So actually for me, the internet opened up a world where I could connect to a uh, sexuality and uh, I would say an idea of uh, tender carnality and romance and friendship and connection, which was more diverse, which was more interesting, which was not limited to my background. So I think that, you know, actually it allowed an exploration which was not very easily available in everyday life. 
But I also want to add one more thing. You know, I think every conversation we have about sexuality, and I don't want to take up too much time, but every conversation we have, we have to remember it's always about a certain class position or a caste position. Like what you experience and I experience even in the same class is different. And uh, I actually, when was, I was living in tenement housing, there was a moment um, in the 90s when all the people on my floor were women and all of them were unmarried and most of them were bar dancers. So actually, what is the sexual morality of women who are bar dancers? What was the sexual morality of people working in the movies of which my grandparents were part? What was the sexual morality of middle class Indians who considered themselves modern? These were very different kind of sexual worlds. And in fact, I don't think that sexuality is a linear developing thing. I think there are always concomitant truths. There are people who are extremely liberated. There are people who call their liberation vulgarity because they happen to be elites and taste makers. There are people who think that they are very liberated who are actually quite conservative because you know they'll never marry outside their caste and their class, but they'll say all sorts of things about gender. So I think it's complicated, but I do think there's one big change with digitality, which is, you know, I think if you're a queer person, digital life has made a huge difference because where you lived in a small town, not knowing if being queer was normal or not, how do you find somebody else? Even friends, lovers, connections, now that is possible, possible in a relatively safe way because you don't have to expose yourself to your community necessarily. I do think that more numbers and more types of people are part of this conversation about intimacy. And I think that the idea of intimacy is front and center of the discourse in a way it certainly was not 25 or 30 years ago. So I do think those things have changed, but I also do agree with Seema that there are conservative ideas and they are different Maybe, I mean, they operate in a different way than one would imagine. And maybe we can come to those later in the discussion. You know, this That's idea of regret. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I do agree that some things have regressed and we could talk about that later. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. I'm going I'm to definitely, I made a note of that. But uh, a couple of things that have stood out to me, you know, you said the word tender carnality that kind of struck a chord, you know, and, and exploration, connection and stereotypes. So now we're going to have a stereotype breaker, Garima Surana, founder of podcast and Sochcast, the wonderful podcast platform that Garima is the co-founder of. So, uh, so Garima, I want to know, you represent the youth, like I mentioned. So, so has digital media changed your generation's view on pleasure? And I, I feel almost like the last two years have been revolutionary, right? Because we've been online mostly. And has it become more central to your relationships? Thank you, Nina, for having me. Um... Very delighted to be speaking with Seema Paramita. Paramita, I've attended one of your uh, sessions at the Tata Literature Festival in Mumbai, I think a couple of years ago, and I was absolutely delighted to hear you. You're so well poised and you know, you bring this terrific energy with, with so many amazing viewpoints. Seema, you're a dear friend and I love the work that you do. Um, coming back to your question, absolutely. I think I learned so much about my own body from the internet. Because, you know, biology class in school was all giggles and coy laughs and, you know, how teachers would slightly brush under the carpet when it was anything to do with female organs, particularly. Um, I learned about consent in a more affirmed tone because of internet. I think uh, I, now I'm not ashamed of saying no. So that's what internet has taught me. I learned about mutual pleasure. I learned that um, a woman's climax is as important as a hero's entry in a blockbuster film. Um, I think internet or digital media, as you said, has taught me much more than my school did. Uh, the fact that I unlearned years of conditioning, I think I owe it usually to the digital media and books, of course. You know, Garima, I feel the last two years have educated me so much, it's unbelievable. And because yeah. I think we're sitting at home constantly online and it is revolution. Actually, if you look at the content and you're in the content space, it's exploded. Suddenly, everybody's talking about mental health. Everybody's talking about sex and sexuality. It's wonderful. And I was talking to Anish and, um, yesterday, who's going to be part of our panel on pleasure and politics. And I was just telling him that I am learning through this event itself, having conversations with people like Paramita spoke, you know, about uh, Paramita, you or Seema mentioned something about uh, caste and class, right? Ableism. I never thought of all of this. I mean, even uh, Seema, till one what sex said. You know, thinking about somebody with with a disability, uh, I'm referring to you because of being the in, like our Jean Milburn, right? So, <laughs> so never and thought I of somebody can, with. Yeah, if I can also ahead, add the fact, of course, you know, as Paramita mentioned, that it's a new space, uh, you know, for for queers to now 
know more about themselves and embrace themselves and you know but with all the ancient wisdom i think that fine balance of what seema also brings in with her content i mean us as millennials so to say we would have never known about how you know what all kama sutra entails and what has our history which is so culturally rich you know um how india predominantly has been a sex nation so to say we're a country of 1.2 billion and we try to you know even use that word and we still write s 3x you know seriously so, seriously yeah. I be, because i've been trying to promote so, some of the posts and i realized good lord anything with sex desire pleasure i don't like that. really it's horrible because one try to make a difference here and i and i'm trying to learn the trick so i made an o into like a zero and that o <laughs> got promoted i'm like you know so that's a digital word and you have to learn how to navigate it i guess but it's it's definitely been an aid and and uh, ally i feel uh, at a huge level right so seema we will come to your ancient wisdom question definitely later because i think we do need to know what are the millennials getting wrong when it comes to sexuality but for now i want to focus on so to the outreach um be inclusive and talk about all ages right so do you find um that uh, is the digital medium helping women across generations relook pleasure in their personal lives i mean are your friends more open thanks to digital media are your friends active on social media do you think this content is making them a difference i definitely think so you know like i was saying earlier that um, just to answer paramita's question um i am talking about like uh, post independence post world war 2 etc um and when the hippie movement starts and like i said you know my parents were very much around in that time just this idea of bringing and maybe that was where i entered um, the space of understanding um Uh, relationships and the reason i say this sorry i am going to come back to what you're saying and i i just think that this is important you know when i was growing up interestingly uh my mother was divorced when she was pregnant with me and she met my first stepfather when i was one and a half they didn't get married they lived together i'm 60 today in delhi um 59 years ago they were living together but so were most of her friends living with their boyfriends and yes parmita you're right it is a class thing um that some things become more acceptable because there's some things that even today are not acceptable in certain circles so you know also going to a college like lsr where you had the whole range you know you had people who would think a certain way and people who were totally conservative so you kind of grew up in a certain um stage of life but i found over time as my age group start to grow up everybody's mindset fell back into the traditional conservative idea so maybe we were different in college but then as you grew up um everything sags it's not just your boobs even your principal sags uh, you know as you as you get older so everybody went back into being conservative and like i said i always see the digital media as a revolution because i just find that this is some you know like parmita and gora garima was saying that it's you find allies and you feel that you can actually move forward with other people at your back i think the people of my age definitely um are still a little bit more reserved about it they don't want to talk about it openly and hence the work that i do bases itself very much on the language that i use so it has to be non intimidating language i know that there are some content creators who you know trying the shock and awe method just because that's one way to break down a wall and go forward i just think that if i'm going to you know being of a certain age trying to talk to women of a certain age having seen the change that comes because a lot of women today feel ke ha hum aise nahi sochte par hamare bachche jab bada bade honge to they'll be fine you know they we don't need to talk about sex they learn it by themselves the thing is nobody learns this by themselves they need allies they need somewhere to go to and if this is the conversation around the dining table that it's conservative it's bad it's not a good thing eventually those same kids will fall into that that revolution will come to an end or maybe not come to an end i beg your pardon other people will take it up but it it does kind of come uh, it gets taken out of a certain generation um so yes i think that people of my age are deaf i was at a dinner last night um very tiny dinner because we're still in covid time so we can't do too many people no five six of us around the table and at one point of course the conversation comes back to the kamasutra and what does it say about this and what does it say about that 
And I just noticed, I was noticing the reactions around me. So there was one lady who's much older and all she could do was giggle and say, oh my God, oh, you know, you start to get, but you know, those things filter down. Whereas the others are, I, I think that they are being able to open up to this idea without putting themselves in the forefront. I don't know if that helps to answer no, your no, question. I mean, so it makes a difference, but you feel they're not part of the active, sort of the, the the activism part of it. Is that it? They, I think that what it? they're doing is they're consuming it and they're becoming part of their daughter's life. Because I find a lot of young girls write to me and say, I've introduced your content to my mother and we watch it together. And so I think that there is a reconnection happening. They won't come up and be in the forefront because they can't. It's too long and too settled the narrative. The bedrock is too hard, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it gives them a chance to be part of it. Now, I'm so happy you pointed that out because I was talking to Lisa finalizing the script and Gia was sitting right here and we're talking about orgasms and whatever, whatever. And I was like, hold on a second. Um, she can sit here. It's fine. And then two days later, she tells me, she says, oh, mama, you got a puppy. yeah?" So she's like, mama, you know, Hazel's been masturbating a lot. And I was like, really? Has she? And I was so proud of her. And I was proud of myself. I was like, oh, my God, I have allowed my daughter to feel comfortable to talk to me about masturbation. So, um, so yeah, I think we have to, I think as, as, as parents, as grandparents, we have to sort of normalize this conversation about sex and sexuality because it's something so intrinsic to our very being. Uh, um, the Paramita coming to you, I love what you say uh, on, on your page that um, agents of Ishq, we give sex a good name and you're not that kind of person who says smash this and break that. It's very, your, your content has a lot of kind of, you know, Nakra to it. I love it. So I want you to talk a bit about your work, please, Paramita. So, I mean, you know, my thing about I don't say the smash and break and all because I don't believe in linearity. So I feel like that linear idea that because, you know, if you say I have smashed a taboo and that's making a revolution, then you'll have to continuously find new taboos to smash and you'll have to keep creating an idea of taboo. And so you're focusing too much on taboo, which totally doesn't interest me. But actually, I think what is interesting is what is it that people are doing to make their lives possible? And I think that you can't typify it. Like you can, you find sometimes the most conservative looking spaces actually hold. Like I'll tell you, my sister, when she got married, she married uh, somebody whose parents are very conventional. They're Hindi speaking, they're from Lucknow. You know, they never met my sister until the day of the wedding. And this is a kind of, it is pretty revolutionary for an Indian family to say, well, our son loves her and she must be great. And it it so happened that they couldn't meet her before, but they were totally okay with it. That's not something that you easily find happening, right? So I think that there are, that one should always be open to finding the thing that you like, rather than saying that it's not a real estate approach that, oh, all people of this kind are progressive and all people from the old times were better or worse or whatever. There are like all sorts of trends at all times. So I think the idea of saying agents of Ishq also emerged because, you know, there's this whole... NGOs talk about becoming agency, agency, it starts to feel so clinical, like suddenly there seems to be no pleasure left because you're so busy cultivating agency. So we're like, okay, let's become not agents of change, but agents of ishq. And let that mean what it means. And I also love the word ishq because it sort of is love and sex both, right? It's desire and it is whatever, whatever that word means to you. And in my mind, sexual liberation is not something that you set up as a syllabus that you have to reach this goal. It is something that people define for themselves. It's learning your own sexual nature, learning what works for you, and hopefully having the possibility to actualize it. You know, There's no ideal world for anybody, but you try to make the best life you can for yourself. And I think I agree very much with Seema that language is a very crucial thing when you want to talk about something. And giving people the freedom to speak about things at their, at their pace. You know, if I want to talk about my desire, but I don't want to make myself vulnerable by talking about it publicly, that shouldn't be the standard that I set for somebody else. I may want to talk about it publicly, you might not. That doesn't make you less liberated, it just makes you you. So I think having a language which allows a larger number of different types of people to enter actually creates a diversity, it creates more possibility. I think one of the most amazing things discoveries for me, when we started Agents of Ishq, we thought we would just produce all this cool content. We wanted to be part of the culture online. You know, the internet is the home of sex. And we said, we'll also put out stuff about sex, all the stuff you can't get in school. But within a few days of starting, people were writing to us saying, I too want to be an agent of Ishq. And I want to tell you about my experiences. So now Agents of Ishq is like 70% 
crowdsourced. It is people contributing their own narratives and their narratives are tremendously diverse. I think uh, the first time that we got a story where a young woman said her mother asked her, what kind of phone should I buy so I can watch porn on it? I've heard people Ooh. do that. I think, is it, real? is it for real? Can it really be so? And if you read that story, her mother is from Kanpur and seems to come from a very conventional in that sense household. So I think, you know, the conversations that are happening intergenerationally, as Seema said, are, have always been more complex than we care to say. And uh, I think because Agents of Ish also gives space for people to be anonymous when they contribute their stories, because we make everything very beautiful. Because, you know, how do we consume sex? We mostly consume it through pornography. And pornography, is, let's face it, is not famous for its production values. Like, it's not very good looking, you know. So I think that the idea of putting sex in a domain which is very friendly, which is very lusciously beautiful, which has these colors, which has a language you're used to, which has words that you can make up. Like, you know, we will say Nangu Pangu for naked, which makes it yeah. feel very like <laughs> easy. So to make it easy to enter, to make it easy to enter, whether you are a polyamorous person or whether you have never had intercourse, everybody should be able to enter on their terms. No terms should be superior or inferior to the other. That is what aesthetic and language can do. And that is what I think that our emphasis on Agents of Ish was to create an aesthetic and artistic language that would be as inclusive as possible. And what has happened over time, and that I think is the strength of digitality, but it's also something you have to consciously seek, right? So we also do things offline and bring them into the space. But what also happens is the language itself gets modified, right? Like when somebody writes, so who, who lives in the South writes for us and they use slang from their language, it actually increases the vocabulary we have. What we don't have is language to talk about things that have always been spoken of in secrecy. And because there is secrecy, not a chosen secrecy, which is exciting, but a secrecy which makes you feel ashamed. Because of that, we are not able to speak about our feelings. And what are the people on Agents of Ish doing? They really are Agents of Ish because they are co-creating with us a language in which we can speak about our intimate experiences from within an Indian context, not using a secondhand language that is generated out of the US or Europe, which is the tendency online, right? So I think that is very important for us. Yeah. And the good name thing, good name, you know, it's such an Indian Love thing. Like, sex is my good name. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Saramita, I have to ask you, right? Because you you guys are the ones changing the narrative and the script out there. How does one support your work? Since it's crowdsourced or whatever, how does one support your work? I mean, you can give us money. That's pretty That's easy. That's exactly what I'm saying. I want to know who's giving the money. I really want to know. How, how, who are the people that one should reach out to, people who are creating this kind of content, people who want to make a difference? Because yeah. it's, it's a big question mark. It is hard to raise money, I would say, for yeah. this kind of... You do some partnerships, some collaborations. We have some nonprofit funding support, uh, but it is not very easy, I think, you know, uh, for anybody who's doing this. And I think for content creators who are independent, it can be a real schlep. Like you're, if, if in the end the go, if the, in the end the fate of content is to just become branded content, I don't know. Like you know, that's not much of a fate to have. It's like, it's like the fate of amorousness can't only be marriage. It has to be many different things. So similarly, content should have many different destinations. But I think those are questions. Those are questions we should ask. Those of us who are online and those of us who are using social media, which is so corporate controlled, we really have to ask. Like the relationship of the audience with the work. It should be a relationship of love and support, you know, and it should be mutually constructed. And how do we do that actually? Because that's what is lacking in the world right now. And I also feel, I mean, um, as, as a creative person, somebody who creates content or whatever, one feels that credit is so important, right? And I feel two things happen. Um, and I made a note of this, right? So the insecurity of the body happens. There's so much uh, comparison that happens out there on, on social mm -hmm. media. And also in terms of, uh, um, of the work, there's insecurity. How do I own my damn work? I can take your photo from here, Paramita, and Thoko, it, remove agents of Ish, put my thingy here. Uh, you know, Garima, I can take... Do you know what I'm saying? How do you... People, how do you... <laughs> people do do it. So there's a, there's a line by Bob Dylan in a Bob Dylan song that goes to live outside the law, you must be honest. So uh, they, oh you always say the law has been created for people who are essentially dishonest and have to be kept in line. But ethics is something you have to build, right? Like ethics of attribution. So Agents of Ish has been heavily plagiarized and is plagiarized on a daily basis, sometimes in a covert fashion, sometimes in an overt fashion. And, you know, you recognize your DNA when you see it out there, but there is nothing you can do, actually. You could spend your whole life fighting about it, 
or you could you know i mean what can you do that's the world out there i'm going to put it right here bob dylan and the lyrics right here baby don't let it hurt you <laughs> yeah so, so you, can make a a you can make a t-shirt that says be cute attribute i got that <laughs> garima new business idea new business idea for you um so so garima you're you're a digital baby right so um and and now you're hosting i was so excited to hear that i i followed your instructions i put on earphones and all um and and now you, I listen to your your uh, your the podcast that you're hosting now yeah and, and now you and I want you to talk about that so and now you're hosting one of India's first audio erotica through podcast um yeah. where do you think we are heading and how do you think this will change the script right so I'll talk about whispers in the dark that's what the show is called uh, this is Sochka's endeavor to normalize pleasure to break the wall and to initiate conversations around normalizing pleasure and sexuality uh, you know you just said that your daughter said the word masturbation and you felt delighted that she's okay to talk about it and you felt normal unfortunately if i can say 95% of indian homes if you ever say masturbation it can be equated to terrorism right now how do i break that taboo so whispers in the dark is an immersive audio experience for all genders for all sexual preferences divided into eight episodes where all you have to do is just plug and play literally you just have to listen to that so how there's guided meditation right we all know about that this is a series of guided masturbation experience it's very tastefully performed it's written by professional erotic writers we've gone like literally in search of finding the perfect voices that could that could help you experience that pleasure experience that orgasm it's in collaboration with a leading sexual wellness brand um and the whole idea sparked from the sheer need of catering to people's desires you know parameter spoke about desires trust me i have friends my juniors if i even tell them hey do you masturbate they would get all sort of jitters you know the word masturbation in itself so um yeah whispers in the dark is streaming across all leading platforms this is an innovation in the west audio erotica is now becoming a big thing because again you know how mainstream porn is it's it's there's male gaze it's performed to a level which is not even real but audio it triggers you it gives you that imagination that scope of creativity it leaves you wanting to touch yourself wherever you want um and still not have that apprehension of if my body resembles this you know porn star's body or not so mm-hmm. yeah that's whispers in the dark anybody who is intrigued please check out the show um we we cater to all sexual preferences so there's an episode that's talking about heterosexual love where the woman is dom and the man is sub there's another which is vice versa there's an episode for gay uh, men there's an episode for lesbian women there's an episode for transgenders as well the beauty is that each episode is written by the person representing the community because i would never as a heterosexual woman know how transgenders make love right so um yeah that's that's how we are headed and uh, it's a platform sochcast is all about apni soch duniya ko sunao and i think i'm a staunch believer of normalizing pleasure i've had many conversations around it every time i speak it just you know inspires and enables me to do something more so yeah so garma you're talking of a script right we're talking of the narrative changing i want to know how did your family react to this when i did you know in in whichever capacity i could tell them i did uh <laughs> you know try to wrap it and sugar coat it and tell them that this is what i'm up to but i think they've been supportive um i was actually very apprehensive about the fact that now when i'm married i have two families to look at and two families to be answerable to right and i didn't know yeah. how would my in-laws ever receive this that their daughter-in-law is making a show which talks about masturbation and, and ensures that you ha- reach to the climax by the episode ends you know but it's it's been a great journey can't say very easy but um, yes i think i'm definitely inspired by you guys you've set the foundation so right that it allows me to do something more every day wonderful thank you so much garima um seema the question that was um, i think garima you mentioned about the ancient text and all and i i i want you to talk about in that context seema 
that what is the one thing that millennials today get wrong about sexuality? Oh, okay. Uh, I think I'm going to borrow from what Paramita said and said that it's not linear. So it's just that so many levels, so many things happen that it's not really about um, whether it's somebody getting it wrong. But I'll tell you what, in exactly the same way as Paramita talked about the idea of ish, the idea of the beauty of the language and a lot of stuff that we grew up around, you know, just this the gorgeousness of the Urdu poetry, the the shyly, the, you know, just that lovely idea of sort of falling into a little area over here that makes you feel good, which comes from something that is way beyond the idea of porn. You know, when you watch something, when you watch porn, okay, let's just generalize. When you watch porn and you see some the, the act happening, that is an act, it, it happens. And a lot of people jerk off to it. It just happens again. But it's, you know, when you get to that point where you just want to kind of melt into something and you feel that gorgeousness, I think that's unfortunately where um, we have lost that particular narrative in modern times. And I'm when I say modern times, I'm even talking about my youth because when I grew up, I certainly wasn't given the Kama Sutra to study. But the Kama Sutra has been around for 2000 years we've lost the, what the metaphors mean. And I, you know, that's where it really boils down to the gorgeousness. Like I was saying, it's um, most people don't understand this. It's written in seven sections. Section two is the bit about the arts of pleasure. The rest of it isn't. The book was primarily written for men because in those days, 300 something AD, women were not taught how to read or write. It's written to teach men how to live their best life in society. Section two, which is about pleasure, is I think where the women come in, the courtesans wrote that. I'm very, I'm kind of convinced from some of the stories behind it. And it's written to change the narrative of women because it's totally written to tell men how to pleasure a woman. It's written to tell men how women feel and what all should be done. And do you know what, what's really amazing is that unlike other ancient erotica from other parts of the world, the Kama Sutra never ever talks about the act of sex. It never says, okay, now you spent three hours pleasuring her in this particular way. Now you have sex, now you have the thrusting, this is how much fluids, da, da, da. It doesn't even come to that point. It just kind of dissolves from one gorgeousness into another. And um, I don't know, Paramita, maybe you haven't um, come across some of this work. So this one is just for you. You know, I found, so like I'm saying, we weren't taught the Kama Sutra because we, the metaphors of the Kama Sutra have been lost and that's what makes it beautiful. So the day I decided to write my book, Paramita, was when I discovered, till then I was a storyteller, I'm happy to do it orally, that much easier, da, da, da. I discovered that every single position is associated to a piece of jewelry. And you were taught, women were taught how to execute that position from the way that jewelry moved on your body. So um, when you were going to be on top, which was not a position that most women were allowed to be, in ancient times, it's a position of power. So in um, Judaic Christian mythology, uh, you're actually called a demoness in this uh, Lilith who's called a demoness for saying that she could be on top. The Kama Sutra, of course, has positions where you're on top, but it says that for pleasure, you only move your hips when you execute this position. You don't move the upper, upper part of your body. And for this, you would wear a jingling girdle on your waist with lots of ghungrus and then make sure that the gungrus didn't make a sound. Oh gosh. So this particular uh, position in literature, whenever it's talked about, because 2000 years of our literature is inspired by these metaphors. You never ever say, then she climbed up on top, then she did this. You, you kind of talk about how she put on her jingling girdle. And you know that she's taken her position to, on top. And you know what all is going to happen. And, you know, I know that when we talk about this, um, or when I talk about the different ways of perfuming, because every part of your body has to have a different perfume, right? So, uh, because each perfume, they say, has a different impact in different parts of your body. But just the excitement, first, of perfuming every part of you in a different way. But then, when you leave your perfume on your lover's body, what perfume are you leaving on what part of their body? You know, it became almost like a dependent on what you've been doing. So it was just about triggering that those nerve endings in your brain 
that lead you into an area of pleasure. Eventually, the body has to come together. Sex is performed in a certain way. The body is limited in what it can do. It's the imagination that goes everywhere, like Garima was just saying about her podcast. It's about giving you that image vocabulary, that vocabulary that can take you into those spaces. And that's what we've lost, you know, because it's just so gorgeous. When you start talking about perfume, you start talking about different pieces of jewelry, you know, the idea that you're on top, you stud your hair with flowers and you tie your hair back. And then as you make love, you shake it open so that the flowers fall out. And there's entire chapters written on how, you know, it falls in a pool around the floor. And then what that sight of the flowers on the, on the floor do to you, because it reminds you of what was happening earlier. It's to me the, it's to me, it's just the, the idea of the gorgeousness lost because like I said, for whatever reason in recent years and past, um, like let's say the last 15, 20 years, we have become more aggressive. We've become more um, like, no, we will not talk about this. It's become more of an issue. The only place that we've left open for younger people is pornography. It's the only place that they can go to. They're just, it's like an entire gap. There's nothing real over there. And that's all they're getting to watch. I was sent a, a clip of, by somebody to review. I don't know why they sent it to me, Indian porn somebody decided to make this Indian porn and um, oh my god I have to tell you so they were probably thinking that they're doing this from a good gaze the ethical porn thing you know it was vile one is they were doing it on a low budget so they didn't have somebody sort of saying what they should do so they had a nice room you know the kind of room that any of us might have in our house they had two people who Again, when you look at a lot of the South Indian porn, they didn't look like that. They look very much like two North Indian people from the average middle class family, people that you would know. And they had this so-called conversation between them to show that there was a relationship going on. But they were talk, they were saying these words in Hindi and you know what, it really sounded um, terrible because we've come to associate those words. With, and it was just, it was so mechanical. It was so awful that very, I mean, like I think one minute into it, I was like, okay, I'm going to heave, I'm going to throw up. I can't, I can't deal with it. So yes, I think that the one thing is that we never ever tell young people about pleasure. It's almost like a taboo thing. We never talk about it. Sex education, if ever it happens, is limited to the fact that bodies come together. This is what is inserted into this, and this is what can happen. And then you can either get pregnant or you can have STIs. We never talk about pleasure. And I think that that's what we're missing. You know, Seema, I, I can't take my eyes off you. How are you so sexy? Were you always so sexy? <laughs> Just tell me this. Seriously. I'm like, <laughs> did you learn? No, did you learn this? I want to know because you're talking about the arts of seduction. I mean, I'm reading your book and I'm thinking, like, oh my God, if I do this a little bit, would I look stupid? Like, how do you always look so sexy and freaking gorgeous? How do you do it? <laughs> you know, this is why I love you, no? You say all the right things. <laughs> no, I have to say yeah. though, I mean, like most people, even if you grow up in a, in a family where everything is very open and all the rest of it, like most people, I grew up in the same society. You grow up with the same problems in your head around sex and sexuality. You have the same ideas in your head as everybody else does. And I think it was only when that little penny dropped and you realized that actually my pleasure is something that's very special to me that you're, you you become a different person. I found that I've just changed as a human being when I realized that pleasure is valid and my pleasure is my own to deal with the way I want to rather than being told by somebody else what pleasure should be. Um, yeah, but thank you. Can I just add something to what Seema said? You know, the fact sure, sure. that, um, you know, these movies, and I'm not talking specifically about porn movies, but even, you know, Bollywood movies, now with OTT we have, um, you know, almost no censorship on OTT. So the fact that, you know, uh, we see so much intimacy now. Um, I was actually reading about this new uh, concept of having an intimacy coordinator um, for these Bollywood movies. And her name is Astha, Astha Khanna, if I'm not wrong. And uh, she's, I think, one of the first uh, few in fact, one of the first uh, coordinators or Bollywood, you know, seeing a concept like this where they 
direct intimacy in a way where it looks real uh, it looks more passionate and of course you know it's not staged so i think that is also something that you know with now digit with the onset of digital media we're now learning about concepts like these and you know uh, doing better if i may thanks for highlighting that garima uh, parmota i want to come to you i recall seeing um, sexual etiquette somewhere mentioned on your on your website and we were trying to figure out how to phrase this question right that uh, how and who decide the rights and wrongs during sex in a relationship there's no rule book hmm well i mean so, i, I think, think that you know, the parameter i want to say like you know like things like um babe i don't need a, i don't need a condom uh, i'm safe H how do we figure out the, what's right and what's wrong i mean i think uh, this idea of sex et that we talk about now we have a column we used to, we used to have a column called small doubts uh, and it was about the small doubts that you have about uh, if somebody uh, if somebody goes down on me am i supposed to go down on them in return or if i hook up with someone should i ask them to stay the night is it bad manners if i don't want them to like these are real questions of uh, life that people are Uh, confronting as they lead a very different intimate life than earlier generations did right and i think it, it's always important to remember that actually the changes in society mean that we are now continuously meeting more different types of people than people did before it's okay you know when you meet people only of your own class background mostly there's a lot that is understood you don't like many norms are just known and expected but as you meet different kinds of people you actually don't know what is okay for another person what's okay for you and you know there's a lot of debate there's a lot of discourse around consent and i think that uh, discourse is not useful to us in any way because it's very hard edge it's a legalistic framework right yes means yes no means no but i don't know if you've seen we made a lavni about consent the consent lavni and that that actually breaks consent down into yes no and maybe because there is a very big maybe in all sexual interaction so i think like this idea of uh not making about absolutes but recognizing that it is very contextual everything that we do is contextual so how do we actually deal with context that is what i think a really good sex education does it doesn't actually set up a rule book but it sets up a kind of ethical framework of course you have information but you need a capacity to make sense of information right so i think uh, the sex et idea came from the fact that if you follow the logic of good manners a lot of confusions about sex will be sorted out right like for example i really hate that video that says sex is like a cup consent is like a cup of tea because i don't think consent is like a cup of tea like in india if you go to somebody's house say you're doing you're making a documentary and you go into the house of somebody uh, in a village and you say no to their cup of tea you may think you're being very consensual but there are so many aspects of caste and feeling insulted that do you not want to drink water in my house or not drink tea in my house these are complexities right so i don't think that like these very simplistic kind of analogies help i think we should talk about consent in the context of sex what happens inside sex that is not something we discuss you know so we always talk about sexuality and we're always talking about it in abstract terms but we're not talking about in the granularity of actually what happens inside sex now you know i think it would be pretty cool if i owned enough jewelry to think about how every piece of jewelry moved in my body but actually i don't so that's one issue for me i was thinking as i was listening to see <laughs> <laughs> you know and then i mean there are all kinds of people right like all kinds of people who feel comfortable with some things don't feel comfortable with other things so i think sex ed allows you to think of a method that you will deal with people who are different from you it's not a one size fits all idea you you take every context bit by bit and you mind your p's and q's you don't assume and uh, the thing is a sex ed column also is embedded in an entire space where you know for example thinking about what karima was saying about masturbation that in 2016 we started this masturbation shairi contest right so we asked people to write a shairi i mean a couplet and i thought like nobody will answer we did it but i didn't really think anybody will but we got a lot of entries and then every year we have it and every year the entries grow and they come in different languages and they are pretty stunning so i think that you know because the sex ed column is embedded in a context where people are talking about masturbation they are talking about pleasure they are talking about being asexual 
they're talking about what they want from intimacy somebody wants to hook up a lot somebody really wants to have longing and desire and waiting and biraha and everything like the whole naika thing it's all good right everybody is different these are all different kinds of desires and they're all different aesthetics of desire and so i think when you understand that ye sab hai aur iske andar i can't assume and i just have to be polite and so we would say we got a question from somebody saying i like if i see somebody that i think is hot on the bus why is it violating consent to stare at them and this is the question somebody might have so you do need to take it seriously instead of just stigmatizing them and saying how dare you think like this i think it is more helpful i mean the first principle on agents of wishkis is the thing that we are making helpful is it going to help people actually in their everyday life or is it just going to throw another funda at them if we are just going to throw fundas at them there's no difference from what we learn in school and what you're you know what you're getting online it should not be that funde bazi so that's the idea that you can stare at somebody and look away quickly before they become uncomfortable you can't keep staring at them i mean there's nothing wrong with you feeling desire for somebody but they are under no uh, uh, compunction to respond to your desire or even acknowledge your desire is something you need to understand we don't have much training in that i would say that you know uh, because we don't talk about desire much there is a lot of anxiety and then impossibility of dealing with rejection for example and i think good manners also teach you how to deal with rejection so i think those are in the sex ed column we kind of combine these two ideas that you know if you're rejected once it's painful we may acknowledge that rejection is hard but remember that there'll be other people and other people and other people until finally somebody will like you back so don't be don't imagine that you'll never meet anybody else i think people need to be told that as well can i just That's jump in over here and sure. say something that you know we were talking about setting up an ex uh, sex ed class and literally one of the things i said was that the thing that we need to also teach our younger people is that when you fancy somebody 95% of the time you will be rejected and you're not the only person everybody goes through that so don't say to yourself this is what's happened now i'm going to turn into a kabir singh and you know assault everybody out there understand that you're going to get rejected everybody does at a certain age we are all too young to read you know it and we never ever so yeah parameet i think that's an amazing thing to flag up rejection is something that we never teach yeah see ma i i definitely want to um, come to you because we're talking about the digital world right and and i know you have faced a lot of like low key abusive messages right so um <laughs> Okay. Okay. Medha, correction on the question, please. Because Medha helped me with this question. I think that the word here, Loki, it was it it italicized, and yes. So hi, please. Um, so so, what are your experiences? I think it's important for people to know that you create all this fabulous content, and what you go through by putting it out there. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. And how do you deal with this? I think that there's always going to be people who are going to object to whatever you're doing. I could tomorrow say the sky is blue, and I could have people jumping. Honestly, I will do a reel on it, and you know, say the sky is blue today, and there will be people jumping in and saying, "Everything is not about porn. Don't say it is blue." Honestly, I, it, it, you get. <laughs> I'm telling you, you get people objecting to anything. So how do I deal with it? Um, initially, I would just collapse in floods of tears, and get really distressed. And over time, you learn to. So to deal with it a little bit more, the sad thing is that out of the let's say out of every hundred messages, ninety-eight are pure love. They'll tell you how wonderful your work is and thank you for changing our lives. Two of them will abuse you, but you focus on that abuse. And I have learned over time not to focus on the abuse anymore because my initial. So the first person who really looked after when COVID started, uh, my daughter who just finished her university hadn't yet got herself a job. Took over as my social media manager, and when I say manager, I thought she was going to be working for me. It turns out that I was working for her. She was the manager. <laughs> um, and she was an absolute despot. But um, yeah, so basically, it's something that she said, and I thought, you know, maybe it is the younger people like Garima and Sarni are approximately the same kind of age, and you know, they they understand the world so much better because of how much it's opened up because of the digital uh, arena. and she said to me because i wanted to respond and get angry and she said you know there are 98 people out there saying sorry 
the world of COVID also means millions of Absolutely. Amazon deliveries. Um, you know, there are people out there saying, I love you, and they would give anything to hear back from you. And you want to give your time and attention to the idiot who's abusing you. Imagine what kind of, um, imagine what kind of message you're putting out there. And I think that was the changing point. So it still bothers me, but it's something that I can now put to one side. I don't deal with it as much. So we literally, um, yeah, we, we literally put to one side. It's not going to stop the abuse. The best thing you can do is I've also realized that there are entire um, platforms created just for trolling. So there are people who will create a, a thing just to come. I, I had a trainee troll on my, um, on one of my posts the other day. Yeah, he, oh, he was a trainee. Luck. So his first remark was not very bad. Then he realized he had to up his game a little bit. Then he said things like, but aise log jo vagina ke bare baat karte hain, unko to gali padni chahiye. You know, then he went along and said to a few other people, but he was so kind of tentative about it that he got abused and instead, you know, people made fun of him. But yeah, uh -huh. there are actually troll trainee school. Um, you have to, basically suck it up to some level, unfortunately, because no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you're going to face abuse. It's not as if the whole world is going to love you um, without question. So you learn yeah, to deal yeah. with it. Thank you for sharing that, Seema. Garima, I, I want to ask you this question that, um, again, you're a youth representative over here. So you're doing this fabulous job. How many people are out there creating platforms like Sochcast? I don't know of many. I want you to just shed some light on how empowering this kind of work is, how rewarding it is. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? It is. So to, to convert the idea with the client, because as I said, this was a branded collaboration, to tell, you know, and to persuade the client um, on how I was thinking, what was my thought process with what I wanted to do with Audio Erotica and take a plunge and pioneer this for the Indian um, audio landscape, you know, the growing Indian audio landscape. I think it was very difficult. I don't know of platforms that have managed to tastefully deliver erotica, um, audio erotica particularly. Uh, and that was my, you know, one, that, that was something that I was very, very, keen to deliver. I didn't want it to be soft porn or, or, you know, bending towards cheap side of vulgarity. It, when you listen to that experience, these are immersive pillow talks. Um, and when you actually listen to them, you might want to just help yourself. And that's all I want to do with, you know, with, with these series. Uh, and yeah, I think, uh, I, I really don't know about platforms that, that can empower you with content like this, but Sochcast is all about apni soch dunya ko suna aur suno dunya ki soch. Um, I, I'd really love for you, you know, all three of you wonderful women to be part of Sochcast, to share your thoughts as a podcast. We call them Sochcast because it's tailor-made for the Indian audiences and we are all about vernacular. But uh, yeah, I would love to have you guys share your thoughts um, and, you know, I, I can give you all the dope and download about Sochka's whenever we talk personal again. Lovely. Thank you. Garma, it's so inspiring. Really, it takes a lot of guts to go out there. All three of you, seriously, it takes a lot of guts. I mean, when I started putting content out there, I got such language. Obviously, Seema, your content is like way more in terms of um, every aspect, right? But when I when I did that podcast with you, what is it, last, last Jan, the kind of messages I got too, and even today on Twitter, I think Quint Fit had tweeted something and somebody said something, something about these three women seem that they'll be jerking. Some nonsense. And I was like, okay, you know what? Relax. Doesn't matter. He's obviously. And then, uh, and another thing I noticed, went to his page, there's no real photo. There's some like, mm -hmm. half the time it's yeah. just like, you know, a fake accounts or whatever. Um, but but we're, we're almost running out of time. And I do want to ask this question, Paramita, of you that, you know, social media over the last two years has done so much for sexual and reproductive health. Um, and, and rights for India. What do you think about digital activism? Well, I mean, you know, it's hard to say what is digital activism. It's hard to say whether one can any more talk about life in which digital and physical are separated because today both the things are, are one, you know, like our digital and our physical lives are intertwined. Mm -hmm. I think digital activism, like any other thing, has its merits yeah. and its limitations. Uh, I think many things have been achieved through doing things online. 
if we think of something like me too i think uh it achieved a kind of uh, conversation about the day to day sexism that women face via sexual harassment in the workplace a granular a, a lot of other experiences came out which were not workplace harassment but they were a granularity of really unpleasant sexual experiences and unpleasant sex that i won't say only women i think young people are having because there isn't much conversation about what is pleasurable and what is nice to have between two people right or more so i think that uh, that digital media can make those connections it can bring out voices which are not heard otherwise so i'm not one to reject that at all like i mean i think the understanding of issues of caste has been tremendous for us because of digital activism because of accounts that speak about caste similarly for mental health the awareness of mental health is huge um that said i mean i think the digital is just a medium politics is does not reside in technology politics is a way of thinking so you can be as unthinking physically and you can be as unthinkingly digitally as you like or choose to be right so i think that eventually we should stop thinking about the digital as some kind of a magic pill that oh i'm going to reach tons of people and then everything's going to be great it doesn't work like that you know you spoke about uh, difficulty in promoting your posts and i would say the one thing that i have seen it's uh, over 6 years since we started agents of ishq we turned 6 in december and actually how conservative social media platforms have become in terms of what you can promote has only grown so what does that actually tell you right you imagine that social media is so amazing because it can put forward so many things and it can but let's be aware that social media which is what the internet has become it's not as if the internet easily exists in multiple spaces it's homogenizing because it's all supposed to be on social media right now if it's all on social media it is it social media dictates how you can speak and it's difficult to break that social media if you if you want to make a video that is more than one and a half minutes you're going to have a tough time getting it viewed online what can you say in one and a half minutes only some kinds of things there are some things that need to be spoken about for one hour so what is going to happen to those things right the unpopular the unusual the complicated there is a huge amount of room for it on social media which is why you see so much trolling because no answer is so hard to get social media so let i think we should be really very deeply aware of that that it's a form thing it's corporate controlled and that what is called community standards seems to think that people like you and me are not part of the community right like i am not offended yeah. by posts that you want to promote or that i want to promote but somehow my opinion doesn't count even though facebook has wasted hundreds of my hours by interviewing me every year for their community blah 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 blah, blah. but nothing i say is going to be present in what they've done right so i think like let's be aware that like with the with political reality outside of the online world there are lots of forces which are corporate mm-hmm. which are political which are dictating how things happen online the way that we push against those offline we also have to push against them online it's not a simple thing anywhere so yeah that is what i think i think that the only thing is a digital activism so to say it can become very easy to pretend for right like you can Absolutely. pretend you are yeah. you just have to use a few words like smashing and then you can fancy that you are an activist right as opposed to really having to learn really having to think really having to know that requires you to do it like technology makes it possible for you to find but eventually you have to look so a bit a digital activism i would say the analogy is you can go on a dating app and you can match i mean i must have matched 1000 people online or maybe 2000 by now that doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that you will find things you like right that's going to be up to you and the other person and i think activism so, is the same super super so we run out of time in fact there's a there's a work of this but i literally i'm so excited i have this this brain map that i've kind of put over here right now as you all were speaking and i definitely want to throw out some words right so so you you've highlighted so many things i'm thinking of the corporate i'm thinking of being soft i'm thinking of reaching out there thinking of outreach the digital digital and pleasure aren't they're not different the rules are the same right so be honest have ethics have good manners listen uh Uh, get rid of judgment connection exploration uh, tender carnality oh my god i, I have such a lovely life i love that term, tender carnality <laughs> lovely it's been so wonderful chatting with three of you and uh, thank you so much for taking out the time it's it's been such a treat thank you thank Never you for time. having us i you 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 know um with all this word cloud and the recap that you've done i think it's a fabulous job and thank you for uh, you know pulling such a great event despite you were being unwell uh, how are you doing so now 
I'm doing much better, still, still in isolation, but much better. And there's a wonderful team behind this. We have, you know, partners, supporters. It's, so it's, it's, uh, it's a team effort. So each person out here who's in the waiting room, waiting for us to get out so that the workshop can start. Um, thank you. Thank you so much to the team as well, really, for making this happen. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening. Ulja, over to you. <laughs> thank you, Nina, and also all the panelists for such a beautiful session. I was glued to my screen as, as I was learning so much throughout. Also, thank you, everyone. Uh, we really hope that you enjoyed the session today. In the comments below, you can find the link for the live workshop, which is happening now on digital campaigning and storytelling curated and facilitated by purpose. So mark your calendars for the panel tomorrow where we have Raja Chabba from Jabaigo talking to Sachi Malhotra from That Sassy Thing, Karishma Swaroop, Instagram's favorite sexuality educator, No from The Revival magazine, and Kavita Ayagari from Howard Delafield talking about innovation and inclusivity. So look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and have a safe evening. <laughs>